Now, what the heck are zeros? You've been working with zeros, but now we're really going to find out what they are. Okay. Well, the first thing we're going to do is get a visual on what a zero is. So notice you're given the picture of a graph. These are all from your homework. You're given the picture of a graph and you're asked, what are the x-intercepts? Well, let's see. One, two, three, four. So four zero is an intercept. Oops. Four zero is an intercept. I guess I should write it down here, shouldn't I? And one, two, three, negative three zero is an intercept. So let's get rid of that up there. Now, so what are the zeros? The zeros are four and negative three. That's what zeros are. When the zeros are in the real number system, when they're actually on the x-axis, those are your zeros. They're the x-coordinates of the x-intercepts. It's not more difficult than that. It's just a new term to have to deal with. Now we're being asked the same thing here. What are the x-intercepts? Well, they are one, two, three, four, five, five, zero, and again, negative three, zero. The intercepts are points, so they're going to have two coordinates, an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, and I'll write that over them just to help you understand. The zeros of the function that this graph is a graph of are the X coordinates of the X intercepts 5 and negative 3. So visually that's most of the time that's what zeros are going to be. Here the x-intercepts are negative 2, 0 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Five zero. Those are the x intercepts. Let me write x int. And the zeros are negative two and five. So that would be how you would answer these. Ah, now here. Here you've got one x-intercept. But it has multiplicity two or four or six or eight, probably two. So let's put that in as well. And we're going to talk more about multiplicities later. All right, but your zero is one. I've only got one zero. But whenever you have an even multiplicity, the graph 
comes down and kisses the x-axis and then goes back the same way and does not cross the x-axis at that zero. Like they did here, look at this. They did cross the x-axis here and here. These each have multiplicity one. Cut, cut, multiplicity one. Cut, cut, each of these has multiplicity one, which means they occur once. Four occurs once, negative three occurs once. Four and negative three. Negative three and five occur once each. So they have multiplicity one. And you can tell because the graph makes a sharp cut through the x-axis. Same here. Sharp cut through the x-axis, so you know that each of these occurs only once. Ah, but when you have something like this, the multiplicity is two. Now we're gonna learn all about that. But right now we're gonna find out in an algebraic way, what the heck is a zero? Well, okay. We're being asked to determine whether two is a zero of the following function f of x. Well, here's how you find out. You take f of two, which is code for putting two in for every x, two to the third minus 10 times two squared plus 11 times two plus eight, you can do this by hand if you want, or you can do it on your calculator. Okay, so two carat three, and come down, minus 10 times two squared plus 11 times two, plus eight. No, now let me make sure I wrote that correctly. Two to the third minus 10 times two squared, plus 11 times two, plus eight. And I got the answer negative two. So the answer is no. Two is not a zero of this function. If two had been a zero of f of x, then when I plug two in for every x, I would have gotten the answer zero. That's what a zero is. It makes the function equal zero. All right, let's try this. Clear. Use substitution to determine whether five is a zero of the following function. Okay, f of five. Let's try that. Five to the third power minus 11 times five squared. Oh, I'm just so used to putting parentheses. Look, I did it up there too. Plus 13, I give up, times two plus 85. All right, so let's try that. Five carat three, that's five to the third power, right arrow key to come down, minus 11 times 5 
plus 13. Ah. Uh, times 5. Plus 85. Definitely not. Five to the third power minus 11 times. Ah, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I forgot to square the five. Now, I'm going to insert a second power there right after the five by going second, insert, squared. Now, 13 times five plus 85. Hmm, I still don't think it's gonna be. What do you know? But I was wrong, it is zero. It's important, isn't it? to write the right thing. So five to the third minus 11 times five squared plus 13 times five plus 85. I didn't think it would be zero even after the change, but it is. Okay, it is zero, which means, let's write that down, zero equals zero, which means, yes, five is a zero of f of x. Zeros make the function equal zero, which is why they're named zeros. It can still be confusing. Questions just shout it out. Okay, now we're going to find some zeros. And this is nothing new for you. If I want to find the zeros of f of x, I have to find the numbers that will make f of x equal zero. So, I let f of x equal zero, and then I go about doing whatever I have to do to solve this cubic equation. Well, I can't use the quadratic formula. I can, factor by grouping though. So let's try that. I mean, probably I can. X to the third minus eight X squared plus parentheses negative one X plus eight. So zero equals, let's see, we'll pull out an X squared times x minus eight. Now this is a little more difficult because the leading term has a negative coefficient, a net, well, has a negative leading coefficient, which means our GCF has to be negative. So I'm going to take an extra step to do this. I can write eight as negative one times negative eight. And that will make sure I have a negative one in each term. A little math magic there. Okay, I pulled out the negative one and that left me with x plus negative eight or x minus eight. And now my x minus eight and x minus eight match. And 
and my leftovers are x squared minus one. But I'm not done because x squared minus one factors by the difference of two squares. So zero equals x minus eight times x plus one times x minus one. Now we've got it all factored. So I have to solve for x, right? So I set each factor equal to zero x minus 8 equals 0, x plus 1 equals 0, x minus 1 equals 0. After I add 8 to both sides, I'll get x equals 8. After I subtract 1 from both sides, I'll have x equals negative 1. And after I add one to both sides, I'll have X equals one. And those are my zeros of F of X. And note this, that the maximum number of zeros, uh, real zeros, that three zeros, that three can have are, are three, is three. The maximum number of zeros of a cubic e equation is three, and I have three zeros. Each one occurs once. That means the multiplicity of each of the zeros is one. Multiplicity one, multiplicity one, Multiplicity one. All multiplicity means is how many times does this zero occur? Well, duh, one and one and one. Doesn't occur twice, none of them do. Okay. Oh, we get to do it again. Let's not. Well, let's look at the time. I'll, I'll come back if I have to. Oh, joy, look at what we have here. We have U substitution. Now, how do I know that immediately? Hopefully you know it immediately. Any time the leading degree is two times the middle degree, and you've got a trinomial here. We would call it a quartic trinomial. Highest power four. Degree four. That means uh, the greatest number of real zeros I can have is four. Doesn't mean I have to have four. All right, well, let's stop talking and do this. F of X equals, well, let's, let's do our U thing. U equals X squared and U squared equals X squared squared, which is X to the fourth. So I can rewrite this as U squared minus 11u plus 18. Now the value of this is that I've temporarily turned this into um, a quadratic equation, which means I could use the quadratic formula. If I wanted to, but this is very easily factorable. So, now, what am I doing? I'm looking for the zeros and their multiplicities. So, 
If I want to find the zeros, I have to let f of x equal zero. And then first I'll find the u's that make that happen. Then I'll find the x's. Okay, I know that 18, positive 18, equals nine times two, and nine plus two equals positive 11. But positive 18 also equals negative nine times negative two, and negative nine plus negative two equals negative 11. Negative 11 is this, B number, right? A is one, B is negative 11, C is 18. So this tells me how I can factor this. U, U, minus nine, minus two. OK. Now I'm going to set each factor equal to zero. And solve for you first. I add nine to both sides, I get U equals nine. I add two to both sides, I get U equals two. But I have to not let myself believe I'm done because u equals x squared. So now I have to re-substitute. x squared equals nine. Let me scroll up. x squared equals 9, and x squared equals 2. And I'm going to solve this with the square root method. The square root of x squared equals plus or minus the square root of 9. And x squared, yeah, the square root of x squared equals 2 equals plus or minus the square root of two. So the square root of x squared is x, we'll have x equals negative the square root of nine and positive the square root of nine. Over here, the square root of x squared is x, so x equals negative the square root of two and positive the square root of two. Now I know what the square root of nine is, it's three. So x is going to equal negative three and positive three. Whereas over here, these are irrational numbers, so the only exact answers I can get are negative the square root of two and positive the square root of two. These are the zeros, they're real zeros. They're on the x-axis, even though admittedly, you do have to kind of estimate where these two are located. Nonetheless, our zeros of the function and you don't have to worry about putting them in order, negative three comma three comma negative the square root of two, the square root of two. And that would be what you put in the first answer box. In the second answer box, 
you're going to be asked about the multiplicity of each zero. Oops. And each one occurs once. You don't see two negative threes or two positive square roots of two. Each one of these occurs once. So the multiplicity is one. And that's what you'll put in your second answer box. So here's the whole problem. And feel free to shout out a question. Ah, oh, another U substitution. Well, let's see. That's it. Oh dear. Well, you know, these things happen even to the best of us. And I'm definitely not the best of us. Wish I were. Okay. Well, we're going to throw this into U substitution again and see what happens. Um, okay. You, uh, uh, I want to do this in black. U equals X squared. And U squared, by now we should know, X to the fourth. So I can rewrite this. as u squared minus 30 u plus 125. Now, hmm, I know that 125 equals 5 times 5 times 5. Or <clears throat> ah, or negative five times negative twenty five. There you go. Or one, one times. 125 negative 1 times negative 125. Here's how we get our negative 30 right there. For a minute there, I thought, ooh, we might have to use the quadratic formula. So 0 equals, well, this is going to be exactly like that other problem. Um, paren, 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 u, u, minus 5, minus 25. And then we go through the whole process again. u minus 5 equals 0, and u minus 25 equals zero. So add five to both sides, you get u equals five. Add 25 to both sides, you get u equals 25. 
and then you resubstitute. So x squared equals 5, and x squared equals 25. Then you take the square root of both sides of the equation, putting a plus or minus in front of what's usually on the right-hand side, but the square root of the number. Square root of x squared equals plus or minus the square root of 25. So what we get here is that x equals negative the square root of 5 and positive the square root of 5 and x equals negative the square root of 25 and positive the square root of 25. But we know what the square root of 25 is. So we'll have negative 5 and positive 5. So these are my zeros. Right, negative the square root of five, comma, the square root of five, comma, negative five, comma, and five. And that's what goes in the first answer box. And then you notice, oh my goodness, each one only occurs once. Imagine that. So the multiplicity of each zero is one because they only occur once but they are real numbers. Numbers with I are not real numbers. They're in the complex number system. But all of these, you don't see a negative underneath the radical. So, they're real numbers. Let's go back and do that one that I skipped. And then, and then, wait a second here, I need to go back to my math lab. Maybe. Maybe not. There. You never know with my math lab, do you? Actually, they're all like that, though. Technology is kind of, huh. We depend a lot on it. Maybe too much. Oh well. I was having trouble with that earlier. All right, let's do this one while we're here. F of X equals X to the third minus five X squared plus negative one times X plus I mean, now we know we're going to be pulling out a common denominator. And we know that positive 5 equals negative 1 times negative 5. I hope I said a negative common denominator. Not denominator. GCF, greatest common factor. All 
OK, so that's just going ahead and taking care of that. Um, so I pull out X squared. Each term contains an X squared. And each term over here contains a negative one. So we'll have X minus five. And so we need to find the zeros. So we'll have zero equals X minus five times X squared minus one. It would actually have been better to go ahead and put the zero there and there. It would have been if I'd done it earlier, but it got done. That's what's important. Zero equals, aha, what a surprise again. X squared minus one factors into X plus one times X minus one. All right, and then again, we set each factor equal to zero and solve for X. So X equals positive five, X equals negative one, X equals positive one. All right, those are the zeros of the function. And um, uh, they each occur once. So our zeros are, let's do it this way, five, negative one, and one. And their multiplicities are one each. So you just put a one. All right, so we've talked about multiplicities and we've talked about what really and truly are the zeros. But let's tie this into some of the stuff we were doing. Back in the dark ages, before spring break, Feels like almost forever. OK, now. We talked about how you can kind of tell from the graph what the multiplicity is going to be. So. If this has multiplicity two, if this zero has multiplicity two, remember if it goes back the same way, if it do, if the graph does not cross the x-axis, but touches the x-axis, if, if you word this mathematically, it's tangent two. Tangent means just touching, barely touching, and then going back the same way. Um, what that means actually is that the function this is a graph of equals some number, we don't know what, times x minus one, times X minus one. Where does the minus come from? I'll show you. X equals one. Subtract one from both sides. You get X minus one equals zero. That's how you figure out what the factors are. Okay, so that's what that would look like if we knew A we would know exactly. 
Actually, I suspect. Well, and we can keep on suspecting. We don't know, and there are ways to find out. OK, now. Let's talk about a cubic function. There are some things we know. About all polynomials, so let's even put polynomial. In parentheses. The largest number of zeros and X intercepts it can have, that is the largest number of real zeros and X intercepts it can have is three. But guess what? There's something else. So first, let's call this the maximum um, the maximum real zeros and x intercepts because they go together. is three. Why? Because for polynomials, the maximum number of real zeros and x-intercepts are going to be whatever the highest power of the polynomial is. So regardless of what this other stuff is, the fact that the highest power is three means that the maximum number of real zeros and x-intercepts is going to be three. Three real zeros, three x-intercepts. How about four? Same thing. The maximum number of real x-intercepts and zeros that a quartic polynomial can have is four. Well, what would happen if I had f of x equals three x to the fifth minus two x to the fourth plus one. I just didn't feel like writing the rest of, you know, the other stuff. Doesn't matter what the other stuff is. The maximum number of real zeros that is in the real number system on the x-axis, the maximum number of real zeros and x-intercepts is four, a uh, five. We're talking about that, five. X-intercepts is five whatever the highest power is. Now, it doesn't have to have five, but that's the maximum number. Maximum means the most. Same here. Well, we already know it has four zeros, but that's the most it can have. Can't have a fifth one anywhere. OK, 
OK, there are other things we know also. Make sure I haven't got anything else hiding down there. OK. Remember the degree is the highest power. So I'll put it in quotes because I'm talking about the word. The degree of f of x is the highest power. So if you think of that highest power as being either an even or an odd number, like two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, and so on forever. If it's an even number, any even number, then the graph is going to look like y uh, on the ends, the graph is going to look like y equals x squared or y equals negative x squared. Now, what do I mean by on the ends? Ah, so let me do this. There you go. Nothing fancy about that, that's for sure. Here are the ends. Actually, it's the left end. And this is the right end. So I don't know, you could you could kind of make a statement. OK, this is the middle of the graph. And these are the ends. So if a polynomial has an even degree, then out on the ends, and let me make another one here, another graph, very high quality graph, right end, left end. Ah. Left end. Middle. No high class terms going on here. The behavior out at the ends is, is for an even degree polynomial is going to be, it either goes up forever on both ends, or it goes down forever on both ends. And what if the degree is odd? That is, what if the highest power is an odd number? Like one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, and thirteen, and so on, forever and ever. An odd number is a number the two does not go evenly into. 
Well then, we can make a guarantee about end behavior. Okay, so here's the middle. Not talking about the middle. That's where the interesting stuff happens. But out of the ends, what about that? So this is the right end. Left end. Right end. Sounds like I'm talking about football. Left end. Then the graph is either going to look like this, that is it's gonna go up forever on the right and down forever on the left, or the other way around, it's going to go up forever on the left and down forever on the right. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. So how do you know what it's going to do if you don't have a graphing calculator? That's easy also. All you have to do is look at the, the leading term. That's where you find the degree. And that's where you find something else. That's where you find the leading coefficient. If the degree is an even number, then whether you're going up on both sides or down on both sides is going to be governed by whether the leading coefficient, the number in front, the number in front of the highest degree, the highest powered polynomial, if the leading term uh, 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 uh. If the leading coefficient is positive, okay, so if you had something like f of x equals, trying to think of some weird number, 5.332586x to the sixth, plus whatever else, blah, 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 blah. The fact that this is an even degree and this ugly number is positive means that out on the ends, it's guaranteed you're going to go up on the left forever and up on the right forever. But if that number is negative, and the degree is even, and this number is negative, and I don't know, I'm tired of saying f of x, let's say g of x for a while. It's gonna look like this out on the ends. I don't know what it's gonna look like in the middle, 
but out on the ends, it's going to go down forever in both directions. Out on the left and out on the right. And over here, if you have a number like, oh, well, we could go 5.338652, I don't know. Um, X to the seventh, that's an odd degree, odd, odd degree positive leading coefficient. It will go up on the right and down on the left forever and never double back. So you're guaranteed that out on the ends, it's going to look like that. Similarly, if the leading coefficient, let's just make this easy, please. Negative 3x to the uh, seventh, where you have an odd highest power degree and a negative um, um, leading, leading coefficient. There you go. Yeah. It's going to go up on the left and down on the right forever. And these guys are modeled on y equals x to the third and y equals negative x to the third. Talking about end behavior. What it does in the middle, I don't know. Because, yeah, you would have other stuff out here, too. Blah, 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 blah. And plus. Blah, 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 blah. Gotta have sound effects. So the, the highest power term and the number in front of it control a lot. They're super important. And I think we talked about that last week. So this ties in this week to last week, but I'm not sure. Maybe we talked about it, maybe not. Maybe we're going to talk about it tomorrow. I couldn't get into my math lab to check it out. But anyway, that is all I have to offer you today. If you have questions, please hang around. And if you don't, feel free to go. <coughs> okay, does that sound good? I think it sounds great. <laughs>